The blind have their eyes open, the deaf have their ears open. By what power? By not acknowledging that there is any power but one. One power, and that power is God. Now, when you sit down to heal and you pray God to remove your diseases or your sins, you might as well save your breath. Because if you don't, you'll be as ludicrous as these uh, people who write about Lourdes. 100,000 people make a trek to Lourdes, all praying to God and all praying through the same church and all praying through the same priests. And out of 100,000, 15 get healed and they give God the glory. They don't say a word about what God did to 99,800 and... Uh, 985. He just ignored their prayers as if they weren't on earth. Do you believe God healed that 15? Then you don't have a least idea at all of the nature of God. If God healed those 15, he would have healed a whole hundred thousand. Those 15 were healed because in some way, in their own mind, they broke through the limitation of this double power and rose out of themselves. They became bigger than themselves. But if you think for a minute that God had anything to do with it, what must you think of that God that turned his face away from 99,850 and look at the lives of those 15 and see whether you think their lives were any more worthy than the 99,850 whom he ignored. Never again will you be made to believe that you can pray to God for a healing and get it. You don't get a healing by praying to God. You get a healing by conforming your life to the Christ principle of living, learning how to purge yourself so as to be one with God, which you can't be unless you're forgiving, unless you're loving, unless you're praying even for your enemies, unless you are taking all mankind in your prayers and saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, open their eyes. Give them grace to see thy kingdom. Then you'll be healed. You'll be healed and you'll heal others. But don't waste your time asking God to heal you because that's as much of a waste of time as it is to ask God to feed you. God isn't going to feed you. God has filled this earth with his goodness, cattle on a thousand hills, farms loaded with food. It's man that, that's wrecking it, not God. God has filled this, these waters with fish and the air with birds and the land with crops. It isn't God that's withholding. God can't add to that. If he had a sense of humor, he'd look down and say, you better give me some more land to place it in. I'm already placing gold and diamonds and platinum and uranium and apples and peaches and pears and furs. What more do you want me to plant down there? Take better care of it after you get it. See that it's divided in a better way. Don't sit back holding it because you want a monopoly on it and this country won't let loose of it and that country will... That has nothing to do with God. But that doesn't mean that you should have a no lack and you never will know lack. If you're out on the desert, manna can fall from the sky, ravens can bring you food. If you know how to pray, and that isn't praying to God to feed you, that's praying to God to forgive you your debts, your trespasses, to cleanse you from hidden faults, to purify your consciousness, to give you the gift of himself that his grace may touch your soul. And uh, when you're absent from the body and not thinking of your sins and your diseases and your lacks, you'll open your eyes and probably find that the ravens did bring you some food or that manna fell from the sky or that the spirit of the Christ multiplied the loaves and fishes that were right there. Because in two places in Scripture, we were given the secret of how to have an abundant supply. 
Now there isn't anybody on earth who becomes a student of the Bible who should ever know lack or limitation because the lesson has been given in two places of how to live in a continuous state of abundance. The first is when uh, the Hebrew master meets this poor widow who is to lose her son into slavery because she can't pay her debts. And uh, the Hebrew prophet says, what have you in your house? And right there, that is the $64,000 foolish question. Because what can she have in the house if she's going to lose her son into slavery for poverty? But the question isn't as foolish as it sounds. Because she does remember, I have a few drops of oil and a little meal. Ah, that's the secret. Begin to pour. And she began to pour, and it never did stop running. There it was, just running and running and running. Under every need had been met. What was the principle? Don't pray to God for something. Ask yourself, what have I in the house? What have I that I can begin to pour? Supply isn't going to come to me from heaven. Supply isn't going to come to me from man whose breath is in his nostril. It's got to come out of something that I already have. And Jesus picked up this principle and when he had a multitude who were hungry also, and the disciples came wondering how they were to be fed, he asked that same foolish question, what have we? And you know it was a foolish question because he knew they didn't have anything. He knew it, they'd been up there in the mountains there for several days. But he asked it, and those disciples showed the same spiritual insight that the widow did. They said, well, we do have a few loaves and fishes. Oh, that's enough. Break and share. In other words, begin to pour, begin to give. And they fed everybody and had 12 baskets full left over. Now, you see, those are not fairy tales in the Bible. Those are spiritual principles which you can prove. They're not impractical. They're so practical that for all these years I have been witnessing that very principle take care of everything needful in our work and for the many students who come to learn about supply. All you have to do is stop looking outside of yourself for your supply. Stop looking to man and stop looking to God and ask yourself, what have I in my house? And then begin to break it and share it. Begin right where you are. Look around in your clothing closet. Look around in your attic or look around in your cellar or look on your back. Look in your purse. Look somewhere and find what it is you've got. And it may be nothing of a material nature. You may have a lot more forgiveness than you've ever dreamed about, and you haven't used it. You may not have used up that 70 times 7. That's a lot of forgiveness, 490 times, you know. And you may not have used it all up, so you could begin with forgiveness. You may not have used up all the prayers for your enemies. Whatever it is, where there's lack or limitation, it has nothing to do with human conditions. It has nothing to do with how much crops there are or how little crops. It has nothing to do with how rich or poor your country it is. It has to do with how rich or poor your consciousness is. Whether you can say, I have, uh, or whether you insist on being human and saying, I have not. Because there again, Scripture comes and reminds us, to him that hath shall be given, from him that hath not, shall be taken away even the little that he had. So if you just like a little less than you've got, just claim that you've got nothing. And see how soon you'll have less. 
But when you begin to acknowledge, I have, I have, I and my father are one, so I must have something. I must have love, I must have patience, I must have service, I must have some old clothing, I must have something. I've got to find it. I've got to seek within me until I find something that I can begin to give out and share to this world. Break and share. Pour. Make me uh, a piece of meal. Make me a dinner. Oh, that seems hard to tell a poverty-stricken widow to make me a dinner when she hasn't enough for herself and her son. But you see, she did have. The minute she was willing to acknowledge that she had and was willing to begin sharing it. You see, what I've learned out of all these years is that unless we know God, we're lost spiritually. But that the very moment we begin to know him aright, we discover life eternal. At least the measure of it that we can uh, at this time, accept. You see, the most wonderful thing in the world happens when you learn that God is not a giving God and God is not a withholding God. God never gives anything to anybody. And God never withholds anything from anybody. God just is. God doesn't give uh, sunshine today. Mm -mm. No, the sunshine just keeps on going, 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 because behind it, there's the God that made it and maintains it and sustains it. But God doesn't give it or withhold it. It's just there all the time. God doesn't give crops or withhold them. They're always in the ground. Our abuse may lessen them or our harmonies may increase them. How many times I've witnessed in my practice how people rightly taught in prayer increase the amount of food on their trees or the amount of milk in their cows. Not because they set out to increase it, merely because they began to live in accord with the law of God, and the law of God is abundance. The law of God is infinity. It showers down on you when you're in accord with it. And when you're not in accord with it, it would look as if you had to struggle for every little shilling that, that existed. The question here is, there can be no spiritual progress until you have overcome the world. That too is a matter of interpretation. To overcome the world doesn't mean to go out here and battle it. It means to overcome the worldly instincts within ourselves. In other words, when you can fulfill in some measure the Sermon on the Mount, when you can refrain from wanting your enemies punished, in that degree you've overcome the world. When you can refrain from suing for something that you believe is your right, you have overcome the world. You're no longer using the weapons uh, of this world. You put up your sword. When you can forgive, when you can release, when you can pray in secret without your fellow man seeing it, when you can do your alms where nobody will know it and you can't get any credit from the world, when you can do your alms so that even your minister doesn't know what you're contributing to his church, when you can do your arms so that the person you're sending money or food to doesn't know who it came from, you have overcome the world. You've overcome your ego. You're no longer seeking to be glorified for that which really uh, is just a normal, natural act of brotherhood. Why do you think the Master says there are only two commandments? They're not ten. That belonged back to the old Hebrew days. It's a sin for any man to have to be told not to steal. He isn't a man when he has to be told that. He's one of these creatures that Paul talks about. A person who has to be told not to commit adultery, that's not man. That's not man. 
that person hasn't scratched yet even the surface of manhood, much more godhood. When the Spirit of God touches a person, they don't have to be glorified because they did a good deed, because they supported their church or sent money to benevolence. Well, that's nothing but glorifying the ego. That's not a man. That's why the Sermon on the Mount is a hard thing. It isn't impractical, it's just difficult. Adultery, that's not man. That's not man. That person hasn't scratched yet even the surface of manhood, much more godhood. When the Spirit of God touches a person, they don't have to be glorified because they did a good deed, because they supported their church or sent money to benevolence. Well, that's nothing but glorifying the ego. That's not a man. That's why the Sermon on the Mount is a hard thing. It isn't impractical, it's just difficult. Few there be that enter, the Master says, because you have to get up, give up feeding your ego. You have to give up believing that you deserve credit because you sent a $100 check into somewhere or that you fed the enemy. No, it was by God's grace that you did it. And the minute you realize that, you don't need thanks. Oh, you'll receive them and you'll bow graciously and say you're welcome, but you won't take it seriously. You won't let it puff you up because you will know that you didn't do it. It was the grace of God that worked through you. The same way that if you're a good mother, wouldn't you feel foolish if somebody told you you were a good mother? You say, what do you mean? You mean I was just a mother? That's right. There never was a good mother. There are just mothers. There are those who perform the functions of motherhood. Not because they're good, but because that's the nature of motherhood. And they couldn't be otherwise. And so there are people who are honest. Not because it's the best policy, and not because there's a commandment about it that Moses gave the world. No, they're honest because that's their nature. They couldn't be anything else. Why take credit for it? That's our natural nature as children of God. It isn't natural as humans because the human lives only to glorify himself and to get whatever he can out of life at no matter whose expense. But that's not the child of God. Do you see what I mean then? Once you begin to perceive that God isn't giving and God isn't withholding, God is right here in this room in all its fullness. And God knows our need before we do, and it's already here. Right here, within our own consciousness. Now, if we stayed in this room, our need would fulfill itself at every level, every day. If we went out into the wilderness, we would find it there. If we went out to sea, we would find it there. Why? Because we're carrying it with us. I and the Father are one. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. That's a spiritual truth. That, that's not fiction. And it doesn't refer to a man who lived 3,000 years ago. That's a spiritual principle that all that the Father hath is mine. But not mine and not yours, because that wouldn't be God. If it's true that all the Father hath is mine, be assured of this, everything the Father hath is yours. Now we in the message of the infinite way have discovered how to make this good of God available to ourselves. We have discovered the art, the practice of meditation. And uh, we fulfill it in two ways. The first way we call practicing the presence. And that is that from early morning, from awaking in the morning until sleeping at night, we make it an active part of our consciousness to acknowledge God in all our ways or to keep our minds stayed on God. That means wake up in the morning and thank God that this is the day the 
Lord hath made and it must be beautiful. God made it and God maintains it and God sustains it. And at breakfast time to acknowledge again, not uh, outwardly where man can behold our uh, prayers or thanksgiving, but inwardly, silently, secretly, thank thee, Father, for this bountiful table, for without thee there would be no crops in the ground. Thy spirit hath made it all. Leaving the house for business, for marketing, for social engagements, thank thee, Father, that thy presence goes with me, for where thy presence is, there is safety and security and peace and joy forever. And so it is, finding, well, at the beginning, probably 20, 30 opportunities during the day for acknowledging that without the grace of God, I would be nothing and have nothing. But with the grace of God, I am all and have all. As time goes on, this multiplies itself until you find that a thousand times a day wouldn't even be enough to keep up with your constant recognition that I of my own self am nothing. Only by the grace of God am I healthy, wealthy, wise, safe, secure, at peace. We call this practicing the presence of God like Brother Lawrence of centuries ago called it practicing the presence of God living always in the consciousness of God's presence, thanking God, glorifying God, acknowledging God in all our ways. That's the first step. And the second step comes after some weeks or months of this practice, you then find it possible to sit down quietly two, three, four, five times a day and meditate. And your meditation now is easy because you have been filling your mind so full of God that now when you sit down to meditate, obstreperous thoughts do not come in, or if they do, you've learned to ignore them and pay no attention to them. You never try to still your mind. That's a very dangerous practice. If thoughts want to go around in your mind, even bad ones, let them. They're not your thoughts. You're not guilty. They are world thoughts. You, we are all antennas for what's going on in the world. And there's a lot of bad thoughts going through every single one of us. It doesn't belong to me and it doesn't belong to you. It isn't your nature and it isn't mine. I'm ashamed of them when they go through me and I'm sure you're ashamed of them when they go through you because you know they're not you. And you just wonder how they got there. Well, I can tell you, they got there by virtue of this universal world mesmerism that sends us thoughts of doubt of God it sends us thoughts of animality. It sends us thoughts of carnality. Paul called it the carnal mind. Mrs. Eddy called it mortal mind. They mean the same thing. It means the worldly mind of man, that which is enmity against God. It's a universal thing. It isn't personal. It doesn't belong to you or me. But you and I suffer from it until the time when we begin to so fill our consciousness with God that gradually only God is there and these other things never come in again. Now, in meditation, you open yourself to the kingdom of God, realizing the kingdom of God is within me. God is neither low here nor low there, but within me, here, where I am. The very place whereon I stand is holy ground. For I and my Father are one. God's grace is where I am. My Father knoweth that I have need of these things, and it is his good pleasure to give me the kingdom. Therefore I need not fear what mortal man can do to me. I need not fear what mortal conditions can do to me. For I have learned that God is the only power there is and that the mind of man isn't a power, human thought isn't a power, ignorance isn't a power, sin isn't a power, fear isn't a power. There is only one power. That's God in the midst of me. And so you see, 
you learn to meditate and you receive God's grace in your inward parts. You learn then that you do not really pray. That's only a figure of speech. You really never pray. That man was right who said, I know not how to pray. I know not how to go out or come in. I know not what to pray for. Father, bear witness with my spirit. Make intercession within me. And our real prayers come to successful fruition when we learn that we do not know how to pray and cannot pray, that our prayer is an attitude of receptivity in which we let the word of God enter our soul. He uttereth his voice, the earth melteth. When you hear the still small voice within you, you can be assured that it is destroying some of these illusory pictures of human sense. Prayer then, in the final analysis, becomes the ability to sit and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. I am listening. Speak, Lord. I'm listening. I'm here. And then you'll find that that state of receptivity ultimately receives the grace, the Spirit of God within. It must have prepared the soil by weeks of forgiveness, weeks of sharing, weeks of love. Love thy neighbor as thyself, even thy enemy neighbor. Then you'll find that now you have naught against any man, and man has naught against you, now you're free to receive the answer to prayer, the grace of God within you. And then you'll know that you can look out at this world and say, now I realize there are no powers out here. I have been accepting infection and contagion as power. I have been accepting hereditary law as power. I have been accepting weather and climate as power, but now I know. These are only power in the human mind that accepts two powers. But now I know there is only one power, and I acknowledge only one power, and I accept for myself and my world only one power, the power of God which is in the midst of me. And as you persist in that, and hold to it, and live with it, that becomes the law. And then you will find these other things are not power. Now any of you who have ever had a healing, metaphysically, have already been the beneficiary of this principle, because no metaphysical practitioner has ever been able to heal by might or by power, neither by physical might nor by mental power, because it can't be done. The only way that a metaphysical practitioner heals, even those who don't know it, even those who don't know how it's done, and that merely means most of them, I guess, the only way it's done is when the practitioner arrives at a state of consciousness within that feels that God is the only power and that this thing that's facing them isn't a power. Then the healing takes place. As long as a practitioner would believe that they've got a sin or a disease to overcome, give them up, give them up, don't, work, don't, don't bother with those practitioners because they lead you into a lot of trouble, more than they're in themselves. Don't do it. A practitioner has to know that there is no power in either the things or thoughts of the human world except the power that the world gives it. But that in reality, God is the only power. And then when that feeling of the presence of God is there, the sins, the diseases, the lack, the limitation, the unemployment, the danger, all of these things pass. But that's the principle. That's the principle in which you can be healed. That's the principle upon which you can heal. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, not by physical might, 
not by mental power, but by my spirit. And when the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, I am ordained to heal the sick. When you sit in the silence, and ultimately that feeling does come to you of inner peace or joy or release, the healing will take place even if your patient is 10,000 miles away. Because in God there is no such thing as time or space. None whatsoever. Where I am, God is. But that means where I am, where thou art. It's all the same I, the same presence, the same power. There's no such thing as time or space in the kingdom of God. There is only instantaneity. Where thou art, I am. Where thou art, I and you and you and me and we're all in God. Instantaneity is uh, the secret of God. Here and now, all that God is, I am. All that the Father hath is mine, for I and the Father are one. Do you see that? All of this becomes clear to you when you give up all idea of God as a Santa Claus, who's sitting there with a great big bag of wonderful things that you want to get. And for some unknown reason, here sits this genial Santa Claus laughing at you and not giving you what you want. Now it's up to you to see what you can do to make him give. There is no such God. There is no such God. God has filled this earth with sunshine, with rain, with his glory. And all we have to do is to get out in it and let it flow. What have you in the house? I have all that God has. For I am the Father one, and I'm the instrument through which the infinity of God is flowing. Or oh, it may only appear as one shilling today and seven tomorrow and twenty the next day, but it was all there the very first minute that I recognized it. Unto infinity, it's all there within uh, neither low here nor low there, but right here. The kingdom of God, allness. God is fulfillment. Where God is, there is fullness. Where his presence is, there is fullness. Everything complete. Health, harmony, wholeness, completeness, perfection. Beauty, purity. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom from every bondage, lack, limitation, sin, disease, death, old age. There is no such thing in the presence of God. Well, there we are. There we are. It isn't only beautiful. I didn't come here really to tell you anything beautiful. I came here because this has been an experience of 28 years. I've watched it in demonstration in many countries of the globe, not among a few people, tens of thousands of people. And I can tell you the average is better than 15 out of 100,000. Yes, it's better than the 99,850 out of 100,000. And in the 15 cases where it doesn't work, it's because the individual won't let it. They're not yet ready to overcome the world, that is to give up their resentments, jealousies, <coughs> angers, hate, <coughs> greed, lust, animality. And of course, even God can't break through there. Thank you. Is there something that you want to say about uh, anything further? Is there a meeting yes, tomorrow night? Something. Yes, good. Thank you. Thank you. You've been very good. Thank you. dat Joe Goldsmith morgenavond bereid is ook hier weer een lezing te houden. Ik ben overtuigd dat het allerweer tegenwoordig zal zijn, want is hij niet wonderful? Ja, zo wonderful. En daarom nog lang niet genoeg zijn we opgekomen om te luisteren naar deze stuiper, helderlijk, eenvoudige boodschap. 2000 jaar geleden gegeven is en nu uitgebracht wordt 
op deze manier. Ik ben overtuigd dat het als een sneeuwbal de wereld rond zal gaan. Ik ben overtuigd dat dat de kracht is van God die zich gaat openbaren hier in deze wereld, op deze aarde, dus deze mensheid die uiterlijk zo ontzaglijk in de war is en geopend is. Maar de sneeuwbal van Gods kennis zal over de aarde gaan en daarom ben ik ook overtuigd dat alles zich zal oplossen in vrede en in harmonie. Als wij maar trouw zijn aan wat Jongen ons geleerd heeft, de commandments, de bevelen, de principles die onze Jezus Christus gegeven zijn. En ik denk wel dat het naam van u alles spreekt als ik zeg, thank you. Ja, thank you. Thank you.